All right, can everybody hear me out there? Okay, I think I have everybody unmuted, but I'm gonna mute you uh, as we get started. Microphone check. All right, so I've got 11 o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. I appreciate uh, everyone who is here. Uh, thank you very much. Today, we are going to talk about responsible gambling. Um, so without any further ado, let's get started talking about responsible gambling. So the first thing I wanna call your attention to is the very top. It now says responsible gaming. What's up with that? So for this presentation, responsible gaming, responsible gambling, and responsible play will be used interchangeably. For me, uh, gaming usually means video gaming, but the industry, uh, the casino industry, often uses the term gaming uh, to mean gambling. But for our presentation, uh, gaming, play, and gambling will be used interchangeably. There are some people out there that use responsible uh, gaming or the idea of responsible gaming as it's just the casino's responsibility to protect their customers. There are some people that think it's just up to the players to protect themselves, but it's really a shared responsibility between not just both, but all the stakeholders. Uh, there are, you know, it's up to the government also to regulate the industry. It's up to people like me, counselors, uh, to look out for other, uh, for the players. It's up to the entire society to ensure that um, they're socially responsible, 
that all the stakeholders are protected and that it uh, remains a fun endeavor for everybody involved. So who is 800 Gambler? 800 Gambler is one of the things that the Council on Compulsive Gambling of New Jersey does. The Council on Compulsive Gambling of New Jersey is a nonprofit organization that's funded through casino licenses. A portion of each casino license fee is set aside and given to the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. That's the agency in New Jersey that oversees and licenses addiction treatment. So a portion of each casino license fee is given to them and they oversee what we do. One of the things that we do is we operate this 800 gambler hotline and gamblers or family members of gamblers or people who care about gamblers can call into this hotline. They usually call in after a big loss, uh, are usually in crisis, and they can call into this hotline and we can typically talk them down from crisis a little bit. We can refer them to a mutual aid or self-help meeting. Um, a typical referral is to Gamblers Anonymous for the gambler or to Gammonon for the family member or someone who cares about a gambler. Those are 12 step meetings, but we might refer them also to Celebrate Recovery or Reformers Unanimous, which are Bible-based meetings. We can refer them to Refuge Recovery, which is a Buddhism-based meeting. We could refer them to Smart Recovery, which is a science or psychology-based meeting. We can't make them go. We can just tell them where they are and tell them what to expect. Those are just some of the meetings that we could refer people to. But we also operate a network of treatment providers in New Jersey. There are between 45 and 50, we're trying to expand that network of therapists and counselors where we can send a family member, someone who cares about a gambler or a gambler themselves for an assessment. And I'm sure you know, an assessment is a whole bunch of questions uh, that for a gambler falls into nine categories. And at the end of the questions, the therapist or counselor can determine whether treatment is warranted or not. Uh, if the gambler can't afford to pay or doesn't have insurance that can pay, if the therapist or counselor is in our treatment network, they can send us a bill. We are a funding source for gambling treatment. Many states have funded treatment. Not every state has funded treatment, but many states do. And if you think about it, it, it makes sense. A disordered gambler, if they had money for treatment, they would very likely spend that money gambling, um, thinking that that would be the way out uh, of their gambling problem. More gambling to turn that money uh, into a bigger win. If treatment was warranted, we can pay for up to 26 sessions in a 12-month period, so every other week for a year uh, of treatment. Our office is just outside of Trenton in Hamilton, or Hamilton, New Jersey. Um, I am Ken Litwack. I'm an addiction counselor who specializes in gambling and trauma. People are sometimes surprised to find that we are not against gambling. We are not a lobbying organization. We are neutral on legal gambling. We are against illegal gambling, so underage gambling or dog fights, we're against that kind of stuff. Uh, but as far as legal gambling goes, we're neutral, which allows us to partner with the industry on some occasions. We do um, internet customer service agent training. We do uh, responsible gambling training with managers and executives at the casinos. Sometimes we sit in on in-house trainings and sometimes we even critique their training. We work with therapists, uh, we train therapists, we go to schools and senior centers. We go to uh, conferences and uh, we really go anywhere people will allow us to talk about problem and disordered gambling. So that's kind of who is 800 Gambler, who is the council and who am I? Today, we are going to talk about problem and disordered gambling. So right there, we need to stop for a little more clarification, disordered Gambling is the clinical term, the actual diagnosis for gambling addiction. Uh, you already heard me talk about uh, compulsive gambling. You've probably heard the term pathological gambling. Those are subclinical terms. At one time, they were the diagnosis, but today they no longer are. 
The only clinical diagnosis is disordered gambling. It's been that way since 2013. Uh, problem gambling is a blanket term. That means it can encompass disordered gambling, but it uh, is often used to mean someone who does not quite meet full diagnostic criteria. So they're starting to have um, interference in their life, but maybe haven't had an assessment yet. There's another term out there that you may have heard that I would ask you to never use, and that is uh, degenerate gambling. I've heard that on ESPN. Uh, I had someone actually walk up to me at an event and say that he was a degenerate gambler. And um, I would ask you never to use that term. That's a stigmatizing term, and that would be best left in the past. We're also gonna compare internet gambling uh, to brick and mortar gambling and talk about some of the unique aspects. We're gonna discuss co-occurring disorders. Um, we're gonna talk about responsible gambling and some of the warning signs of gambling problems and how to refer or where to go for help. So with responsible gambling, it's important to keep in mind that you know most people can gamble and don't have a problem. It really is only a small percentage of people that who gamble that will develop a gambling problem. Nationwide, it's only about 2% of people who gamble that will develop a gambling disorder. But when you think about it, most people gamble. And 2% of most people is millions of people. And in New Jersey, we develop a gambling disorder at about triple the national average, about 6%. And although 6% is not a huge percentage, it is still a lot of people. It's hundreds of thousands of people. So online gambling, why is it so popular? Well, for one thing, right now all the brick and mortar casinos are closed. But it's also very easy to do. I live about six miles from Atlantic City. I can see Atlantic City from my home. It takes me about 10 to 15 minutes to get to Atlantic City which compared to how long it takes me to open my laptop, no contest. Very easy to get online and gamble. Plus, if you don't already know how to play, again, no contest. If you were to try to learn to play in a casino by going up to a table game with people who know how to play and are playing for money and try to buy in, you're gonna mess up their game if you're lucky, they're going to give you dirty looks. They're probably going to give you negative feedback, verbal feedback. You're going to hear about it from them. They might even confront you. It's much easier to learn step by step for free online. It's a growing industry, so they're doing a lot to promote that field. Uh, they have a large advertising budget. They're doing deposit matches and a lot of uh, loyalty programs and rewards right now. It is much faster paced. There are fewer breaks in the action. There is, um, at a brick and mortar casino, if someone comes in and wants to buy in, that's a break in the action. At a brick and mortar casino, when a dealer needs a break, a new dealer has to come in, that's a break in the action. At the end of a dealer shift, a new, new dealer comes in, another break in the action. That doesn't happen with online play. In fact, with online play, you can enable your space bar to place a bet every time you hit your space bar. That's much, much faster play. Which actually brings us to a comparison of brick and mortar play. And when you compare brick and mortar to online play, the service offered by online gambling just lines up very neatly to someone with gambling disorder. And that's not a criticism, it's just an observation that someone who has a gambling disorder is going to gravitate towards online play. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this. Oftentimes when people begin to gamble, they go to a casino with friends. And an early indication of developing a gambling problem is that the friends will be ready to leave and someone who's developing a gambling problem doesn't want to leave. By the time they have a gambling problem, it's no longer a social engagement. They're isolating. They're playing by themselves. When you play online, you can't help but play by yourself. The reason 
at a brick and mortar casino, they make you buy chips, is there are studies that people spend more money when they play with chips. Psychologically, it's a step removed from um, playing with cash. When you're playing online, electronic transactions are a step even further removed from chips. How far removed is that space bar from cash? When you go to a physical casino, there's a sense of reality there. You can hear the casino, you can see the lights, you can hear the machines, hear the talk on the tables. You can smell that they smoked in there for 27 years. Online, it's a sense of fantasy. You can imagine yourself as a better player than you really are. We already really talked about the ease of access and uh, driving distance comparison, but there really is no contest. And stigma versus hidden. You know, there are professions and people who just wouldn't want to be seen going into a casino. Maybe a religious leader or a school teacher or a politician or even somebody with a job like mine wouldn't want to be seen playing in a casino, whether they have a problem or not. Any of those people could have a gambling problem and be playing online and nobody would ever know because it's hidden. So let's compare lottery versus casino style. You know, there's, of course, draw, lottery drawings and lottery scratch-offs. If you were to sit in a parking lot of a convenience store, you might see somebody buy scratch-offs, go to their car, go back, back into the uh, convenience store, buy some more scratch-offs, go to their car, go back in. This is pretty common. Um, with lottery, there's less of the big man on campus personality, the big uh, personality, the quarterback of the football team personality, which we'll talk more about. Chasing losses is a bit less prevalent in lottery gamblers. Uh, there is um, a hoarding task force in Atlanta County uh, where the casinos are where I live. And I've talked with some members of this task force and they've told me that on occasion, they've run into a situation where they've found years and decades worth of lottery tickets. Um, and a disordered gambler people will sometimes describe them as gambling to lose. And this is not quite accurate, um, but they are not necessarily gambling to win either. They're gambling to stay in play. And it's kind of like video games. The idea behind a video game is to keep your character alive as long as possible. And that's kind of true with gambling too. You wanna to keep your money alive as long as possible. And with lottery, you can keep in play for a longer period of time. You may buy a lottery ticket on a Monday for a Wednesday drawing. Uh, so it's something to consider. Also very long odds with lottery. Um, it's difficult for humans to really comprehend the vastness of the odds in lottery. Um, and one way that I think is a good way to look at it is if you uh, consider a soccer field. Um, now, a soccer field, a professional soccer field, is bigger than a professional American football field. So if I walked out to a soccer field and I picked um, a particular blade of grass and then I left the stadium and you came in behind me and tried to pick what blade of grass I chose, that's about the same odds of choosing the numbers in the lottery. Um, so pretty long odds. There is actually such a thing as lottery, lottery strategy. If uh, somebody is talking about all the significant numbers in their life, that's not responsible play. But if somebody is talking about higher order math and they're talking about um, a small lottery of maybe one or $2 million that has rolled over, uh, not had a winner maybe once or twice, um, maybe that is someone who's talking about lottery strategy because that is a real strategy. Um, but that, again, now we're getting a little bit outside the scope of this um, presentation. Uh, people who um, play lottery can sometimes be susceptible to advertising also. We know some famous um, groundhogs who um, play lottery. So let's talk about the phases of problem gambling. This is not the phases of gambling. This is the phases of problem gambling. So it may seem a bit counterintuitive, but in order to develop a gambling problem, you have to start out winning. And it sort of makes sense when you really think about it, because if you began gambling and all you did was lose, 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 it's very difficult to get hooked on that. So I'm gonna show you this list in a different format. We're gonna kind of walk through it a little bit more carefully. 
And I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit and we're going to walk through, through this. If you only occasionally went to a casino and were gambling, but actually were winning fairly frequently, what would you do? You would be very excited and you would probably gamble more often. You would also probably increase the amount of money you were playing with and start having fantasies about going yacht shopping or new car shopping or whatever it is that you would uh, get excited about what you were gonna do with your winnings. You would probably play more often also. If you then had a big win, and big is subjective. You know, it could be $300, $500, $5,000, you know, whatever, uh, enough to buy a car, whatever. Um, enough to get you excited and keep you going. That's the winning stage. And you would be telling people about it. You know, you would be happy for yourself. You would think you were good at it. That would be the winning stage. Now, it's important to remember that in modern gambling, none of the odds are in the favor of the player. All of the games in a casino, the odds are in the favor of the house. That's how they make their money. So over time, as someone continues to play, it becomes a statistical impossibility for the player to walk away with money. But as they continue to play, they begin to, the pendulum swings the other way and they begin to have prolonged losing episodes. And people don't really wanna say, yeah, I'm taking a beating, I'm losing now. And maybe they start covering up and maybe lying about it. This might be where uh, a good time to talk about the most common uh, explanation for how they did. Uh, if somebody says, how, how'd you do? Uh, at the casino, the most common answer is I broke even. The reason people say that is if uh, they say I won, then they say, oh, well, you know, break me off something. Give me, you know, give me something. Uh, if they say they lost, then they open themselves up for negative feedback. You know, oh, you shouldn't have played, you know, that was our bill money, you know, or you could have done something good with that. You could have given that to charity, whatever it is. So the most common response is I broke even. But anyway, so the pendulum has swung the other way. They're in prolonged losing episodes. And so now they're starting to isolate a little bit. They're thinking more about their gambling. They're trying to get back to their winning ways, but they're losing. So maybe they're starting to take a little bit of money from places that they really shouldn't be. Maybe they're bill money. Maybe they're starting to delay paying their bills, thinking that they'll take the electric bill money, play with that, win some, pay the electric bill a few days late uh, and keep it going. And maybe doing that kind of stuff is making them irritable and restless and seems to cause some personality changes. They're delaying paying their debts, they're irritable, so their home life is becoming unhappy. Maybe they're borrowing money from friends or borrowing money from work, maybe legally or illegally. Maybe they borrowed money from their electric bill and didn't win enough to pay it back, and so they're unable to pay their debts, which is affecting their reputation. Maybe they're getting to the point where they're asking for a bailout, and a bailout is trying to get somebody else to pay your gambling debts. So now gambling is taking up a significant part of their time because it's weighing on their mind. They're going to bed thinking about the money they owe, they're waking up thinking about the money they owe. They're stressed out, they're alienated from their friends and family, um, they're maybe remorseful and panicking. So I can um, give you an example of what remorseful and panicking might look like. Um, maybe an older person who has sold their home uh, and has moved into a senior living facility and um, you know, has to pay monthly rent, but has gone through their life savings and now thinks, oh my goodness, how am I going to pay this monthly rent at the senior center? Uh, I'm going to be in my 70s and homeless. Another uh, example that I can give you is blaming others. This is somebody I, I talked with, um, somebody a bit younger had been taking credit card advances uh, to pay gambling debts and was looking for bailouts from family members 
and was getting bailouts from family members. And this is what's dangerous with bailouts is they got back to zero. The gambler was back to zero uh, and thinking, okay, well, now I can keep gambling and was getting back into debt, looking for more bailouts. The family was doing it. And at some point the family said, that's it. We're done with, uh, with the bailouts. And um, so the gambler says, listen, if you don't give me money, then you're going to affect my credit rating. It's not my gambling that's the problem. It's not my credit card advances that's the problem. It is that you are not giving me money that's going to affect my credit rating. So blaming others is that's a pretty good example. So things are getting pretty desperate, desperate and illegal acts start to seem like a good idea. So I'm going to back it up a little bit because when I zoomed in, it cut off this blue box, this blue box, I call the crossroads. Um, but to give full credit, this chart was designed by Bob Custer, who Bob Custer is sort of the Johnny Appleseed, Johnny Appleseed of um, problem gambling uh, recovery. So in this blue box, um, it's sort of the crossroads. Um, people are hopeless. Uh, they are suicidal. They might get arrested. Their alcohol or substance use has really escalated. Um, they're really in trouble. They're either going to get into recovery or they're going to kill themselves. And gambling has the highest suicide rate of any addiction. Uh, the Council on Compulsive Gambling puts a number of one in five disordered gamblers will attempt suicide uh, out there. And uh, we get that number because GA, Gamblers Anonymous, says about 13% of disordered or 13% of their members will attempt suicide, but not all disordered gamblers will join Gamblers Anonymous. The American Psychiatric Association says about 17% will attempt suicide. Mark Potenza of Harvard University has research that says 21% of disordered gamblers who visit Las Vegas will attempt suicide. So the number that the council puts on it is about one in five. So about 20% of disordered gamblers will attempt suicide. And um, you know that's roughly the number of people with a heroin addiction who will overdose. So those are mostly accidents and suicide is mostly intentional. So, um, you know, of course suicide is intentional, um, but I also think that even as high as those numbers are, that might even be a bit unreported uh, or underreported. Suicide, sometimes not always recognized as suicide. Uh, Richard Rosenthal, who helped write the um, DSM-4 criteria uh, for gambling, uh, pathological gambling, uh, can be seen on YouTube describing the continuum of suicide and talks about uh, how sometimes a suicide attempt might just be closing your eyes while driving on the way home from a casino, uh, not really recognized as a suicide attempt. And if uh, that suicide attempt was completed, might not be recognized as, as suicide, might not even be recognized as related to gambling. So perhaps uh, even that 20% uh, is a little bit low. Um, but anyway, uh, if suicide uh, isn't the option that's chosen, maybe recovery is chosen, and hopefully it is. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, we're not going to get into great detail on recovery because that's a bit outside the scope of today, but it is worth talking about. Um, people who, who are uh, working in recovery do have an honest desire for help. Um, once they get a little time away from their drug of choice, whether substance or gambling, uh, the brain begins to heal a little bit. They're able to start thinking a little bit more clearly, uh, solve some problems, and make some better decisions. Uh, sometimes uh, disordered gamblers are no longer working, and they may not be working because of some action that they took in the workplace. Uh, maybe stealing money, uh, maybe not being able to report to work, maybe gambling at work. Um, maybe they had a win and they thought they would be able to turn that win into, you know, keep it going and continue to, to be a professional gambler. When a gambler who's out of work returns to work, that's a very good sign in recovery. Uh, it can mean that they, 
you know, have rejoined society, that they're not looking for that shortcut of a big win anymore, that they're going to achieve their goals through hard work. And that can be a really good sign. Um, but also that means that they've developed goals and new interests. And that means that they're in the rebuilding stage. Also a good sign. People in uh, early recovery or just starting recovery are often uh, only too happy to tell you about their weaknesses. When they start talking about their strengths, that's a good sign. Reconnecting with family, not just immediate family, but sometimes extended family can be a very good sign in recovery. Less irritation also, not just with family, but even with the counselor or therapist can be a good sign. Uh, less irritation with people in general while driving or while shopping that can be a good sign. Um, preoccupation with gambling, like instead of watching the games on the weekend, um, and not just during quarantine, but um, you know, cleaning out the garage or raking leaves, uh, that can be a good sign too. So um, sacrificing for others in this growth stage, this uh, area is uh, where if sponsorship is gonna, going to occur, uh, they might reach out down to somebody who's in this area and try to help out somebody who's just getting into recovery. All right, so let's move on and let's talk about the types of gamblers that there are. Probably most of us are social gamblers. Uh, most people will buy a lottery ticket once in a while or go to a casino and have dinner or see a show and stay and put a few dollars into a slot machine or play a few hands of blackjack. Um, but we're still able to pay our bills and um, it doesn't interfere in our life. Some people are serious gamblers. We all have hobbies. Um, some people ride bikes, other people garden, uh, some people play video games, some people gamble, but we're still able to pay our bills. It doesn't interfere in our life. Um, you know, that's a serious gambler, someone who it's a hobby. It's one of their coping mechanisms. Uh, but it doesn't interfere in their life. A professional gambler, you know, there are many more people out there who say they are professional gamblers than who really are. There are some professional gamblers out there, and they are characterized by being very disciplined, very disciplined for time and very disciplined for money. But to me, it's very interesting that a professional gambler may, may be very disciplined in his particular area, but not so disciplined in another area. And what I mean by that is he may be a professional poker player and very disciplined for time and money as a poker player, but not so much as a sports gambler. So a problem gambler. So a, pro a problem gambler is starting to show signs of developing a gambling problem. In order to have the diagnosis for a gambling problem. There are nine diagnostic criteria. You have to have at least four. So a problem gambler may have two or three. They're on that slippery slope. Don't quite meet full diagnostic criteria, but it's starting to interfere in their life. A disordered gambler is out of control. It's interfering in their life. They probably can't pay their debts. They probably are letting it interfere with their relationships. They probably have missed educational opportunities or missed uh, out on work opportunities or career opportunities because of it. Um, it really has interfered in their life. An antisocial gambler is just not playing by the same rules as the rest of us. Uh, I, I think a pretty good way to describe or an example of an antisocial gambler is someone who's gambling online with a credit card and has maxed out that credit card and is starting to put in numbers that are similar, just trying to get a card to go through so they can just keep playing. That's a pretty good example of antisocial behavior um, in gambling. So what are gamblers like? Um, well, gamblers typically are, are, are sharp. They're bright, they have a lot of personality. Um, they can be very competitive, uh, they can, have high highs and low lows, highs when they're winning, lows when they're losing. It does seem to be a lens through which they see the whole world. Uh, gambling can be very progressive. 
Uh, there are penny slots, nickel slots, quarter slots, half dollar slots, dollar slots, five dollar slots, ten dollar slots. You know, there's hundred dollar slot machines. Do you think someone who plays hundred dollar slot machines would be getting much out of a penny slot? The more you play, the more you need to play in order to get that, that same feeling. And that's progression. So first drink, first win. Um, we talked about how important that big early win is. And blackouts and brownouts. Uh, people with a gambling disorder will talk about they went to a casino and they remember you know, walking in the door or starting to play and it, the rest is a blur or even worse, they, they don't even remember anything after that. And we already talked about a bailout as what, um, you know, trying to get someone else to pay your gambling debts. But enabling is a little bit different. It's more of a long-term sort of a family situation. And I think a good way to describe enabling is to imagine the cartoon family, The Simpsons. Now, Homer is not a gambler. Homer has an alcohol use disorder. And he goes to work, and he goes to Moe's, and he comes home. And Moe's is a bar, if you're not familiar. Um, and that's really all he does. Marge keeps the family going. She takes the, ki the kids to the doctor. She prepares the meals. She takes care of the house. She really keeps everything going and so that Homer can just go to work, go to the bar, and come home and drink. And that's kind of what a gambling family looks like. Um, very similar, you know. Uh, so that's an enabling situation. So I'm going to compare uh, male gamblers to female gamblers now. And this is less true than it used to be, but it's true enough that it's a, a good uh, foundation for us to discuss. So men tend to be action gamblers. They gamble for competition and excitement, and they typically enjoy skilled gambling like sports gambling and table games. Um, they are more likely to begin gambling underage, and they typically have a longer progression, years, sometimes decades, from early play to um, developing a gambling problem. There is something to consider uh, that we won't know what happens for some time. There was a time not long ago when sports gambling was betting on the outcome of a game. And sports gambling has evolved. Now, with in-play sports gambling, there are dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands, of opportunities to gamble within each and every sports game. So the progression may change from years, even decades, to years, months uh, of a gambling problem. Uh, it's too early to tell, but it's definitely something to keep our eye on uh, when we talk about responsible gambling. Men are more likely to uh, present with narcissistic traits or antisocial issues. So female ten, females tend to be escape gamblers. Um, they tend to gamble for uh, relief or escape from daily life stress or trauma. Um, they are more likely to have depression or gamble to escape from depression or dysthymia, which is kind of a pervasive uh, lower grade dis, uh, depression. Women typically engage in luck forms of gambling like uh, slot machines, bingo, or, or lottery. And they typically do not start gambling underage. Women typically start gambling later in life. In fact, the average age of a disordered female gambler is 46. So why do seniors turn to gambling? Well, some seniors have money in the bank and not a lot to do. Other seniors don't have money in the bank and are looking to add to their income. If you were looking for um, a senior living facility and you go on their websites looking at places, you might see that they um, offer 
mahjong tournaments and bingo tournaments and casino bus trips right on their websites. Uh, so the opportunity is there and boredom. Sometimes uh, seniors you know, don't have the ability to ride a bike anymore, go to the gym uh, or you know, garden, that kind of thing. So physically they don't have as much that they can do. And these bottom two lines, um, these major lifestyle mileposts are significant for addiction. Uh, having lost a spouse or close friends or moved away from home or changed jobs, these major lifestyle changes are significant risk factors for developing addiction, whether it's substance or gambling, which brings us to a comparison of gambling and substance use disorder. So preoccupation um, is a similarity between both substance use and gambling as is escape. Uh, gambling and substance use are very good for escaping from daily life stress or trauma. Uh, if you have a gambling or substance disorder and you try to stop, often people uh, develop intense cravings and tolerance. The more you use a substance, the more you gamble, the more you need to in order to get the same feeling. People with a gambling disorder or a substance use disorder uh, often have difficulty recognizing that their behavior is related to the difficulties in their life. And withdrawal. We all know about substance withdrawal, but sometimes people don't realize that withdrawal is the opposite of what the substance does for people. Uh, heroin withdrawal, for example, um, heroin takes uh, away pain, gives people euphoria, and makes people constipated. The opposite of that is gives people diarrhea, unfortunately, uh, makes people depressed and um, does not take away pain, uh, makes everything hurt. Uh, if you stub your toe, it feels like you broke your leg. Now for gambling, um, gambling does one of two things for people. For some people, they get a rush from gambling. For other people, they're calmed by gambling. The rhythm, the numbers, the uh, thinking it through can be calming. If people uh, you know, are in a disordered state and they're calmed by gambling and they try to stop, they will get anxious. If people get a rush from gambling and they're in a disordered state and they try to stop, they'll get depressed. And in talking with people, uh, they get irritable they have trouble sleeping, and they will report that they're even a little sweaty. So that's gambling withdrawal. But there are some significant differences also. They're not ingesting anything, so you can't test for gambling. There's no visible signs. You can't look at somebody and say, you look like you've been in a casino. There are financial problems with substance addiction, but they're heavier financial problems with gambling addiction. Uh, still early on, people with a gambling disorder don't think that they're addicted. They think, oh, I can resolve this issue. I just need some more money. Gambling does have a nickname. Its nickname is the hidden addiction, and it's very difficult to diagnose. The only way to diagnose it is through self-report. And if you know anything about addiction, which I'm sure you do, it's that the hallmark of addiction is not honesty. Also, it's really difficult to overcome in treatment because the gambler believes that they'll be able to overcome their problem on their next win. And there's a little bit of truth to that. You know, um, if they just had more money, they would be able to keep playing and um, win some money back. You know, in a small sample size of the next play, anything could happen. So some common protectors, common things that people with a gambling disorder would say is, I don't have a gambling problem. I just ran out of money. Uh, they would also say, there's nothing wrong with it. It's legal. Uh, they would also compartmentalize and say, I have plenty of money. I still have a job or uh, I don't have a gambling problem. My wife would have left me if I have a gambling problem or I don't have a gambling problem. I'm too young to have a gambling problem or look at the job I have. I don't, I can't have a gambling problem, or I'll get my money back on the next win. Um, there's no you know, bar anywhere where somebody's saying this next shot of whiskey is gonna fix my marriage, but that's the type of thinking that a disordered gambler has. 
um, this next, you know, play will, you know, get my wife off my back or this next play could send my kid to college after all. So how do you protect consumers or how do um, players protect themselves with limit setting? You know, you maybe set your time limits. Maybe I'll just play once a week or maybe I'll just play, you know, for two hours a day or maybe I'll just play for, you know, uh, a couple hours this weekend, that kind of thing. Uh, or maybe it's, you know, I'm only going to play with this $100 or I'm only going to play $100 Friday, $100 Saturday while I'm down for the weekend. Or maybe if you're playing online, I'm only going to deposit this 50 bucks and that's all I'm going to play with or, or whatever the amount is. And timeouts and self-exclusion, they're related. We're going to talk more about self-exclusion in a minute. But um, timeouts are kind of when you tell an online operator, uh, hey, keep me off that a website for a period of time uh, or you know you tell a, a particular casino keep me out of your establishment for a period of time and self-exclusion is when you ban yourself from all online play or all brick and mortar play for a period of time and like I said we'll talk more about that in a minute. Age verification checks um, I put that in there because I don't know or I don't really think that um, enough credit is given to the online operators uh, for knowing their customer. Um, they, they do go through um, a lot of effort to make sure that kids are not uh, allowed on their sites, that kids are not opening up accounts online to, to gamble. Now they can't stop um, parents from leaving their laptops open in the house or leaving their phones laying around, um, but they, they do work pretty hard to make sure that kids aren't opening up accounts. So there are other, um, there's research out there that says just giving players rules of the game can insulate um, players from developing a gambling problem. Sending responsible gambling information to players um, or having it available in casinos can insulate them from developing a gambling problem. Certainly giving instructions on how to play can help people uh, from having a gambling problem and having access to help. Maybe having kiosks um, or having ambassadors in casinos or having uh, clickable links uh, on online uh, pages. So you can refer um, to 800gambler.org, um, to the National Council on Problem Gambling, or to the National Council on Responsible Gaming, which is an industry um, site. Uh, all of these uh, are manned by people that absolutely would be happy to help out. And let's talk a little bit about self-exclusion. So self-exclusion allows a person to be banned from all legal gaming activities. It's a good program. It's not a perfect program. So in New Jersey, uh, you can request to be banned for one year, five years, or lifetime. At the end of one year or five years, you do not automatically come off the list. You have to petition to come off the list. You can't do it by accident. I have had people tell me that they were put on that list by accident. That's not true. It's not easy to get on the self-exclusion list. Uh, I believe it's like a four-step process, um, so don't buy it. <laughs> um, I know in some states, you have to actually show proof that you have been through treatment to come off the list. If you are on the self-exclusion list, you can actually get a ticket for trespassing if you go to a casino. If you're on the self-exclusion list, Casinos are prohibited from sending advertising literature to you at your home. Now, if you and your spouse went to casinos and were both getting literature sent to the home and only you self-excluded, your spouse can continue to get literature. So not a perfect program, uh, but a good program. And you cannot self-exclude someone else. You can't self-exclude your adult child or your spouse or your ex-spouse or your parent. Um, 
if you lose, like if you're on the list and you go there anyway and nobody catches you, you don't get a ticket and you lose, you cannot sue the casino and get the money back. People have tried. If you win, you have to show your ID to collect your winnings. They will check the list to be sure that you're not on the self-exclusion list. And if you are, they won't give you your winnings. You also cannot receive comps. A big part of the value of the self-exclusion list is that at least in at some point, um, a disordered gambler has said, I can't control myself, I need help. And that's the first of the 12 steps, you know, is that I need help, I can't control myself. Now, for right now, all the physical locations. So in order to self-exclude at brick and mortar casinos, you need to go to either four racetracks, one of four racetracks, or the DGE offices in Atlantic City or Trenton. And those, all four of those are closed right now, along with the casinos. So until April 1st, you cannot go there and self-exclude. You can self-exclude online, but normally that only would self-exclude you online. Right now, nobody can come off the self-exclusion list until April 1st. If someone is sitting around waiting to come off the self-exclusion list and is eagerly anticipating coming off the self-exclusion list, maybe it's not a good idea to come off that list. So, I had a colleague who is not in the gambling field, but knew that I am, knew what I did. His wife were coming to Atlantic City and he contacted me and he said, I'm coming to Atlantic City for the weekend, what should I do? And this is what I told him. I said, make a budget for your gambling and stick to it, but make a budget for how much you're going to spend all weekend and stick to it. And that's true for any gambling weekend, not just for Atlantic City. When you're coming to gamble, it's not cheap. You're gonna have to pay to park, you're gonna have to pay for your hotel, pay for entertainment, pay to tip people, pay for food, and make a budget for gambling. You're making that when you're clear headed. If you get here Friday afternoon, and by Friday night you've already gone through your gambling budget, don't tap into your entertainment and food budget. Stop gambling. Walk on a boardwalk, entertain yourself. But by the same token, if it gets to be Sunday night and you are up, you're winning money, don't call out of work Monday. Go home. Take your winnings and get out of there. But also, play knowing that you're likely to lose. That's probably what's going to happen. You're going to go there and spend money to be entertained while gambling. We have a little bit of time, so I'm going to tell you a story about myself. When I go to the movies, I like to go first class. I go the night the movie comes out. I like to go to the IMAX 3D movie with the glasses. I like to, um, I don't sneak in snacks. I pay for the $4 bottle of water. I get the $6 bag of candy, the $8 tub of popcorn. Whoever I'm going with, they do the same thing. We know we're not getting out of there without spending 50 to 75 bucks. But that's okay. We're going for entertainment. We know that that's what we're going to spend. We're not going there hoping that the person who went and sat in the seat before us dropped their wallet under the seat. We know that we're going to spend money. And if you go there with that idea, uh, go to a casino with that idea that we're going to spend money and be entertained, then you're going to be okay. Um, it's the cost of entertainment. Also, make informed decisions about your gambling. Know the odds. All of the odds of all of the games are in the favor of the house. But not all the odds are the same. There are some games that are better odds than others. And if you win, remember that V chart that Bob Custer made. Um, you 
may never win again. Enjoy that win, but don't let it start you on the road to a gambling problem. Now, if you or someone you know has a gambling problem, feel free to call 800-GAMBLER. Um, we're out there ready to help, even at this time of quarantine. Um, and this is my contact information. This is actually my own cell phone number uh, and my email. I'm happy to help uh, even today. I am not in private practice. I will refer someone to another counselor. Um, But I would be glad to help out. Uh, let's see if I can stop and see if there's any um, questions out there. Um, what do I have out there? Looks like we do have some attendees. All right, so um, maybe typing questions might be the best option. <laughs> uh, I'm not a pro at the uh, webinar at this point, um, but are there any questions? Or comments? see a hand raised now I'm just trying to see how to raise that allow that hand to uh, talk sorry guys Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I tried to raise my hand, send a question I... to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Li Zheng Yang from New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have been in the middle of the training uh, program for obtain certificate. And I have been interested in, um, about, you know, finish it uh, because this, uh, situation comes in mid office so i just wonder since you guys open now have this kind of format to to do the seminar is that also going to be have this kind of format for training so we can finish it the certificate requirement so i think your question is are we going to have more of the 30 hour training so you can finish that to work towards the icgc certification yes correct okay um, we actually suspended our 30 hour trainings because of the um, quarantine. So right. we don't know when we're going to offer another training. Although, you know, we are very interested in doing more trainings. We're trying to expand our network. So did you get our newsletter that came out last week? Uh, about, I got a newsletter for this one, this seminar. Okay. If you so I guess I own your uh -huh. If you, yeah, if you got our newsletter, that means you're on our mailing list. So if you got that, you will get notification when we offer our next training. 
Okay, so you are. Uh, yeah. You don't, so we don't see it. We have okay. nothing scheduled now, but if you're getting the newsletter, you'll get the um, the notification. Okay. Yeah, I I just wonder whether you guys gonna use in this format because it seems it's gonna be a while like this. I have so always nice. Yeah. Food. It is going to be because, a while. We're actually taking the time right now to um, rework our training, uh, to tweak it a little bit. So hopefully we'll have something um, a little bit, a um, eh, little shinier and fancier. Now, I, see <laughs> I do have a couple other questions on here. So um, okay, yeah. if that answers Thank your you. question, I'll go ahead and move on. Thank you. All right. So um, where did my questions go? I had them there. Um, I saw Maria had a question. So, uh, was there a second ago? <laughs> um, I should have memorized that question before I let it get away. Um, how on earth did I do that? Um, Oh, here it is. Okay. So Maria wants to know, um, are there certain precautions uh, the center is making during the COVID-19 quarantine to help people in recovery? Um, there are. Um, in our newsletter, we sent out um, some ideas that uh, gamblers could do to uh, protect themselves at this time, like go to a meeting and online meetings. And we also have stuff on our website, uh, 800gambler.org. So there definitely are some options. There are more telephone meetings. There's a GA phone meeting every Wednesday night, and that has been expanded also. And all that stuff is on the website, 800gambler.org. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, the next question is from uh, Maria says, thank you. <laughs> uh, Linda, is uh, gambling a worse problem than drug addiction? Um, that's a tough one to answer. And um, I guess probably the answer to that is it depends on who you ask. Um, and it depends on what you consider worse. Um, and I don't, I don't think there, there's a right answer to that, honestly. Um, you know, Gambling affects 10 to 15 people around the gambler. Um, you know, gambling can affect people's health related to stress. But, you know, someone who has a, you know, um, you know, crystal meth problem really, you know, often will have worse teeth than a gambler. You know, um, physical health problems can really be affected by, um, you know, uh, substance use, you know, substance use withdrawal can, can honestly be life threatening, uh, for alcohol, um, and for, um, you know, uh, some other substances, you know, I'm drawing a blank right now, cause I'm really, really racking those files in, in my mind, you know, trying to compare the two. So I don't, I don't think the answer is, you know, that one's worse than the other. I think that there's, they're different, you know, there are similarities and differences between gambling and substance use, but I think the similarities uh, also have some differences. I think the differences are also somewhat similar. Um, so, yeah, I think um, there's, a, there's a lot to compare between the two, um, but they're both, they're both bad. Addiction is bad. You know, I, I think that's the, probably the right answer. Addiction is bad. It's loss of control. It hurts people around um, around the people who are addicted. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, and another question is, can we please have 30 hour trainings online? You know, that's something that we have been talking about doing a lot at the council. I know that's something that we want to do. And so I think that is in our future. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen. So, um, Keep your eyes uh, on the prize uh, and, you know, watch this box and perhaps that, you know, will happen uh, at some point in our future. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think you're thinking uh, uh, correctly when we're heading there. So any other 
questions. Uh, if not, I think we'll go ahead and, and end the meeting. I really appreciate everybody uh, who hung in there with me and everybody who tuned in today. So thank you very much. I'm going to end the meeting. Enjoy uh, the rest of your day. Enjoy, enjoy your weekend.